Okay, this is Physics 1B uh, for August 31st. This is the list of topics we're going to be covering today. We're going to start with statics, then we're going to move into fluid flow and fluid dynamics. Um, so this is the first thing I wanted to do is to start off with a kind of a problem that's related to stuff we did last time. Uh, and this is the problem right here. You can read it. So it says, is a manometer tube, I don't know what that means, manometer, I guess it's a tube shaped like this, is uh, partially filled with water. Oil, which is not mixing with the water, is poured uh, into the left arm. Isn't this the right arm? Okay, anyway, uh, until, wait, oil is poured into the left arm. Okay, well, anyway, of the tube and until the oil water interface is at the midpoint of the tube as shown. Uh, both of the arms of the tube are open to air. Find a relationship between the heights of the oil and the water, basically. Okay. Does the problem make sense to you guys? So what do you guys think? How can we go about solving this? Let me get my tablet here. What did we learn last time about a situation like this? Uh, in terms of what's probably going on. Both of these things are open to the air, it says, so this is labeling here that, uh, huh. can you guys hear, uh, that outside the guy that's working on the, um, can you hear that at all? Is my voice loud enough over it to where it's not distracting? Okay, I, I, I can't really hear myself talk, so I'll just do my best to deal with it. So what do you guys think? How can we figure out a problem like this? What do we need to do to uh, to relate these two heights here? That's really the question. How do I relate the height of the oil to the height of the water? What do you guys think? What kind of um, equations did we use last Wednesday to solve problems? Equations that have things like, what's this symbol, by the way, right here? What does that mean, the symbol with the water and the symbol with the oil? Is that a P? It's density, right? So we need some equation that involves height, density, and then what's what's this P? Is that density too? They kind of look the same <laughs> in their diagram. This is a capital P, and then those are rows, which I kind of draw like this. What's the equation that we can use that relates pressure, height, density, and maybe some other things? Yeah, so we have this general equation. We call this like the variation of pressure with depth, where it says that if I have some fluid with density rho and it's contained in some kind of container that has a depth h, that if you go down to that bottom of that depth, then the pressure at the bottom is greater than the pressure at the top. So this is the pressure at the top, right? Or usually just air pressure in this case. And it allows us to find the pressure at the bottom, okay? So what do you think in terms of this picture right here? Why is this, uh, why is this P, you know, it says P not here, that's the air pressure. P not here, that's the air pressure. It makes sense that air pressure is acting on both sides of these things, right? And why is this P down here, uh, why isn't there a pressure for the water and a pressure for the oil, do you think? Why is there only one P? Okay, why would that be the case? Nothing's moving, it's static, yeah. Okay, what, what, why is that? What does that tell you? Why would, why would the pressure be the same? Nothing's moving, that's right. What's another reason why it might be the same? Or, or maybe you can just say more about that. That's accurate, just what's... Yeah, that's exactly right. If the pressure of the oil was higher, right, then the water would just rise up to a higher level on the other side, right? If the pressure of the water was higher, the oil would just rise up on the other side. And that would happen until there was equal forces, equilibrium, however you want to call that, right? Okay, so if we know the pressure is the same, 
the heights are different, right? The densities are different, right? So we should be able to find a relationship between the height of the oil and the height of the water. And it should probably depend on just the densities, right? So we've got this equation right here. And I would say the only thing I really need to add to it is that for one side, we're going to have density of water. And we can write down the exact same relationship for the, for the oil. So then this is going to be for water. So over here, we'll have the oil. Oh, I got to change this. This is the height of the water, right? And then here, we'll have the height of the oil. So it's the same pressure, right? So we can just, what can we do with these two equations? What would the next step be? Yep, so we set these equal. We end up getting guys cancel once they're equal to wait once we cancel those two out we can also cancel the G's right um, so we're left with uh, this relationship that row water H water is equal to density of the oil times the height of the oil so we can then just say that if I take for example let's see we can multiply Row water divided by row oil times H water would be equal to the height of the oil. We could also go find some densities for, like we know the density of water, right? And we kind of know that we could find a density of oil. Let's go pick up some oil density that we can use. use mineral oil. Uh, so this is 0.87 grams per centimeter cubed, which I think is the same thing we spat out last time as kilograms per meter cubed, right? So let's use that. So you're going to have um, so the density of the oil, this would be something like the density of water is like a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. The density of the oil would be like 870. And then you would multiply by the height of the water. And that would give you the height of the oil. Whatever this ratio right here would be equal to. Equal to like. So the oil height would be higher, as shown in the picture. So can you guys give me a reason why that would be from like a conceptual perspective? Why would the height of the oil need to be higher in this case? Yeah, less dense. So I would get 1.15 multiplied by the height of the water. So that, the, the water would be lower by this ratio, right? The oil is higher by 15%, you could say, right? And it's because it's less dense. You need more, you need more oil to occupy the same uh, uh, height as the water there, okay? So, so one thing that you can kind of, um, does anyone have any questions? Seems like you guys, that this kind of made sense. So one thing that you can kind of take away from this is that this is effectively how something called a barometer works. Um, so a barometer is something where you have basically the same setup, except usually one of the things is going to be mercury, and then the other one's going to be what would the other one be in a barometer? Any of you guys read about barometers at all in your textbook or know something about them? Oh, let me draw this. So if you have a vessel, I'll just try to draw it two-dimensionally. That's usually easier to do. So let's say I have some kind of a vessel here. And inside of the vessel, I put mercury. So I have mercury in here. You guys know what mercury is, right? What is what is mercury when I say that? It's the symbols HG from chemistry, right? What is mercury? What, what's another way you could describe what mercury is?
I know it's Monday and it's really early, but don't be afraid to like just type and I'm looking in the wrong chat, aren't I? I'm looking at the one C chat. Look at all these answers you guys said. I'm so sorry. Pressure difference. Okay, you guys are all giving good answers. I apologize for that. Liquid metal. It's a metal liquid at room temperature. Exactly. There you go. Hope that fits. Quicksilver. That's something that it was used to be it used to be called for sure. Okay. So you take a vat of mercury, right? And I left a little hole here because we're gonna add one thing to this. Inside of the mercury, you place a tube. And this is going to be like, just like, think of it as just like a normal test tube that's coming out of here, okay? Out here you have air, right? This is just the atmosphere right here, okay, right? Uh, and that air exerts pressure, right? Exerts a pressure down on the mercury right there. Now this mercury just opens the air basically, right? So what does that do? Well, it exerts a pressure that we call P naught, right? Which is equal to, you know, one atmosphere of pressure. And what does that do? Well... It's gonna it's gonna push on this mercury, right? And it's gonna force the mercury up into this tube, basically. Okay. So what's gonna happen is the mercury is basically gonna end up filling the tube here. All right. Mercury ends up filling the tube, and it fills it up to almost like a flat line at the top. Okay. So you've got mercury inside of here. It fills up the tube, and the air pressures down, so it pushes the mercury up to a certain height. At the very top right here, what ends up happening is that effectively the pressure is zero at the top. Okay, let me erase this little piece right here. At the top of this tube inside of here, the pressure is basically, it's approximately equal to zero. There's gonna be some mercury vapor that's gonna make it non, it's gonna be a little bit higher than, but it's basically like almost like a vacuum at the very top, okay? And then all you have to do is on the side of this device, you make little markings, okay? And those markings basically just represent height, right? And if the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, the height of the mercury here is something that we could actually calculate. I guess we could do it. We could do the calculation, but it's gonna be really similar to what we just did here, right? You just replace oil with mercury. This would be like the height of the air, which is gonna go all the way up to the atmosphere. We don't even need to do that because we know what atmospheric pressure is. So you could just use one of these equations here. Anyway, what you would find is that the height of this column of mercury, let's say we call this height H, if the pressure here is atmospheric pressure, then the height of the mercury uh, ends up being about 760 millimeters. And this allows you to construct a version of like pressure where you can define atmospheric pressure, which is equal to one atmosphere, to be equivalent to, and this is a type of measurement we use, 760 mmHg, which stands for 760 millimeters of Hg. The height, this, this produces a height of mercury that's equal to uh, 760 millimeters. So this becomes like a, a, way to measure, uh, a way to measure atmospheric pressure, right? If the atmospheric pressure grows, then the height of the mercury is gonna go up. If the atmosp pressure, atmospheric pressure drops, the height of the mercury goes down. And so this is something that was, okay, so this is something where I have to, I don't remember for sure, but I think it's like Torricelli maybe, or, or Pascal, one of the two was the first one to construct something like this as a way to actually measure air pressure. And, um, you know, you can use this to measure air pressure to know when there's more humidity in the air when the air is more humid, the air is going to be more dense. So this is going to lead to more pressure. It can also be kind of a, a way to, yeah. All right, so we call this device, I didn't write it down, but it's called a barometer. It's effectively like a pressure meter. All right, you guys have any questions? Why would mercury be a good choice for something like this? Why would mercury be a good choice for something like this? Definitely a good point. There's gonna be a lot less bubbles. Uh, if this was, if we use like oil or something like this, uh, bubbles could get trapped in there. It's really high density. Yep, it's really high density. Exactly. If we were to replace the mercury with water, for example, 
water, so mercury's density, I don't know what it is, I think it's like 20,000 times, so 20 times the density of water. Let's look up the density of mercury. Yeah, so it's, okay, it's not as much as I thought it was. So it's 13.5 times heavier than water, um, or more, more dense than water. So that means that if we had a water column uh, of a similar of a similar setup right here, the water column would need to be 13 times as high. Okay, so let's let's approximate this by saying that this is so. What is it? 760? Is it 760 mmHg? Did I get the, is that number right? It's seven, 76 centimeters. I think that's right. That's right. Okay. So so it's about a meter, right? Let's just call it a meter. It's like a meter of mercury, right? To one significant bigger. So if you replaced it with water, the water would end up being 13 meters tall, right? It'd be as high as like a, a diving platform at the Olympics. Uh, it'd be like 40 feet tall or something like that. So that's not a very realistic device to use for, for measuring pressure. But because the mercury is so dense, you could have something like this and it could it could exist like on a tabletop. We have one of these at the school. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously I can't, um, I can't see it right now. But maybe when we come back, you can ask one of your professors to show it to you. Okay. That is a barometer. It's one of the ways we measure pressure. It's not the only way we measure pressure, but it's just one of them. And it's one we can understand that's related to this problem. Okay. Do you guys have any questions or comments? Okay. So let's talk about how we solve problems in which pressure changes and we want to find total force, okay? And I don't think, did I assign you any problems yet that look like this? I don't know. I definitely will on the next set of homework. I was kind of avoiding them for the first homework. I wanted to keep the first homework really straightforward. So this is a problem where we want to find the force on a dam. Does anyone need me to increase the size of this so you can read what's written there? Or is it okay? Oh, yeah. Here, let's do that now, because I said we would do that at the beginning of class. And I didn't, so let's let's do that. Good point, good point. So at the end of class last time, I asked you guys this question, and I'll, we'll look at it again. Let me make it just a little bit bigger, make sure everybody can see it. So it says, you're shipwrecked and floating in the middle of the ocean on a raft. Your cargo in the raft includes a treasure chest. Here's the treasure chest full of gold that you found before your ship sank. The raft is just barely afloat. Okay, so I, the raft is this purple looking thing here. And I made it so that the raft is like just barely afloat. So it, I should have made it so that like it's above the surface float. To keep you floating as high as possible in the water, you should A, leave the treasure on top of the chest, uh, leave the treasure chest on top of the raft. B, secure the treasure chest to the underside of the raft. Or C, hang the treasure chest in the water with a rope attached to the raft. Okay. So, what kind of answers did you guys come up with this and why? More than one answer could be correct, too, by the way. I don't know if I said that last time. Okay, but you gotta say why, can A or there'll be no. You can give an answer, but I'd also like to see like a reason that you think that's the right answer. It would give your raft more volume. How could you, you can't change the volume of the raft. hole on a boat mm, maybe that's not exactly the answer I was looking for okay that is a really good answer what Delvino said is exactly right because the ocean would help to alleviate the weight of the treasure chest that's right so if we if we take this picture right here and we redraw it um, to see what happens when you put the treasure chest on the bottom um, and I could do force diagram or something I don't know if that's gonna be helpful 
So here's the line of the water. When you when you take the treasure chest and you put it beneath inside of the water, um, the treasure chest technically weighs less in water in a way. Why? Because it feels the buoyant force from the water. So we take this treasure chest and we put it on the bottom. What happens is that the total force weighing down on the mat on the um, the raft is reduced. So the raft is now actually going to rise up a little bit here. All right. So the the, the raft is now going to be above the surface. While and and by the way, by the way, the answer is B and C. These do the exact same thing. It doesn't it doesn't matter if you tie it underneath or if you if you hang it. So whether you put it like I don't know how you. How do you fasten it to the to the bottom? What do you like have a bunch of tape and you, I don't know. So let's just draw the case where uh, there's a string. So you get a rope and you put it down here and then you put your treasure chest here, right? Whether you, as long as you get the treasure chest underwater, as long as you get the treasure chest underwater, it's going to cause the, the raft, raft, it's gonna cause the raft to rise up because when you look at the forces acting on the raft, not on the treasure chest, but on the raft, what you're going to have is there's going to be there's going to be the weight of the raft. You're going to have the weight of the treasure chest. Okay, the, let's just work, don't worry about the weight of the person because it's not going to change in either case. Okay, it's going to be the same from from this point to this point because the person's sorry, left the person off. If you really want to make the treasure chest right, right higher too, what you could do is the person could actually get in the water as well and just kind of hang on the back, right? Because that would help as well. Because then your weight wouldn't be directly weighing down on it, but instead would be kind of just floating in the water. Because we float pretty well in water, right? Um, now, in this scenario here, it's no longer the weight of the chest that directly pulls down on it, right? It's the tension in the cable, right? So now what you have is there's tension here that's the same as the tension here, but then on the bottom right here, what you're gonna have is there's the weight of the chest pulling down, but there's one more force that I didn't include here, and what would that force be? Yeah, the buoyant force acting on the chest, right? So there's also, I'll just draw it like that and say it's B, and then this tension, oof, I'll just, this tension then is equal to what? Uh, the weight of the chest minus the buoyant force. So this this piece right here is why in the, in the first picture, it's the total force weighing down on the raft is the weight of the chest, the weight of the raft. I left something out here. There's also a buoyant force on the raft. And then in this picture, you're going to have a buoyant force on the raft too, except that buoyant force is actually going to be a little smaller because it's rising high out of the water. But there's this additional buoyant force acting on the chest. That extra upward push is what allows the, the boat to, to, to safely ride a little higher in the water so you don't get uh, overcome by waves or something like that. Now, what's what's awful about physics is like, I can draw all these like free body diagrams and maybe for some of you guys this is helpful, but I really like the way that uh, Delvino said it, which is just, this is a much, I like, I prefer conceptual answers, I guess, versus this stuff, maybe because this stuff is easy for me to draw the forces. Maybe it's easy for some of you, maybe it's not. But the idea that the chest weighs less in water it's just a simple thing to say, basically, and, and I hope that that's what you take away from this. It's just by putting the chest under here, it weighs less than it would if it was sitting here. Does it really weigh less? No, there's more buoyant force acting on it, but its apparent weight, which is what matters, is uh, is definitely smaller. Okay, does that uh, that do you feel like we we answered that, Andrew? So where you understand it? Does anyone have any? Uh, any questions? If not, feel free to ask more questions. Okay, I say yes. All right, good deal. Thank you for bringing that up. I definitely wanted to start class with this today, but I, but I forgot. Okay, that's a nice break from what we're gonna do next anyway. So let's let's talk about this problem. Okay, so force on a dam. Uh, water is filled to a height, capital H, behind a dam of width W, as you can see in the picture there. Um, determine the resultant force exerted by the water on the dam. All right. Let's start off with the kind of basic question right here. Um, 
what direction does the water pressure exert a force on the face of this dam right here, on the inner face? Perpendicular, that's right, because any type of fluid is going to exert forces perpendicular. So there's going to be a force basically this way, directly this way, right? That's that's the direction of the force on the dam. Okay. Now, how do we find what that force is? Well, um, there's there's a whole kind of explanation here, which you can read if you want to. We probably we probably will as we're doing this, but let's just go slow. What I would say is that. Um, We've said before that if the pressure is constant, that force is basically just equal to pressure times area, right? This would be constant pressure. I think I told you guys that if the pressure um, changes in any way, we have to use a different expression. So if the pressure is changing, and certainly you guys would agree that the pressure here is different than the pressure down here, right? Because we have this equation that relates the pressure at every single point, basically, right? Okay, so different pressures, we have to use this equation. We have to say that there's going to be different amounts of force, uh, and that pressure is going to probably vary in some way over the surface, okay? This equation, I think, I don't know, it looks, it's like calculus in a way, right? You can tell we're clearly going to be doing some kind of calculus here. But what it says is that the force that's felt um, down here is bigger than the force that's felt up here. And the force basically changes as we go up here. Why is it changing? It's getting, the force is getting weaker towards the top because the pressure is less on top than it is on bottom. So, yeah, that equation says the force is different at every point along the surface. So the dA represents the surface, okay? In fact, dA is going to be something that we're going to break this thing apart into, okay? We're going to take the walls of this object, and it's already been done here, and we're going to split it up into these little slivers that are red, and we're going to say that the area of that little cut right there, we're going to call that dA, okay? So that little cut right there, it's going to have a name. We're going to call it dA. That is this entire cut right here. That's what we're calling dA. It's a, it's a slice of the object, okay? You could say it's a infinitesimally small area. And in this problem with the information that's been given here. We're calling this the origin of a coordinate system. We're saying the y direction points upwards, the x direction points to the right. Increments along the y direction are going to be called dy, and then this whole thing is dA. And what we can do is we can actually define what that is in our problem right here, okay? So what would, what would that be equal to? What is dA equal to in terms of the given variables in this problem? Okay, so this is something you got to think about. Okay, so it's not dy, but it is w dy. Okay, so this is simply a rectangle, right? Don't don't get don't get too confused by what's going on here. This is 100% just a rectangle, right? This red thing. Yeah, rectangles have areas that are equal to length times width, right? Well, there's the width w, and then there is the length or the height, whatever you want. You got to multiply by. Now, it's not w times d times y. It's like w multiplied by dy. These are two different things. dy is an infinitesimal change in the y direction, and that gives us the dA, right? Okay. You guys have any questions so far? Now, we can con combine these two together here. Let's, let's just kind of, let's read through this. Because I, I think some of the information here is pretty helpful. I, I said some of this stuff already, but so it says 
Because pressure varies with depth, we cannot calculate the force simply by multiplying the area by the pressure, as the pressure in the water increases with depth. The force on the adjacent portion of the dam also increases. Does that all make sense to everybody? Different pressure at the top, different pressure at the, top, the bottom. Because of the variation with pressure with depth, we have to use integration to solve the problem. And then it sets up, let's imagine a vertical y-axis with y equal to zero at the bottom. We divide the dam into narrow horizontal strips at a distance y above the bottom, such as the red strip. The pressure on each strip is due to only the water, and atmospheric pressure acts on both sides of the dam. Okay, so let's try to continue this. So this tells us that the force acting on the sliver, so we could actually add this in here as a, as a force if we want to. There's a force that's acting on the sliver itself. That's what we call DF. And we say, okay, well, DF is equal to the pressure multiplied by DA, right? This is DA, so times W times DY. What about the pressure? How could I describe what the pressure is at this location here at the, of the red strip? What's the pressure at that location of this dam? What's the pressure at the location of that red strip? Sorry. P naught plus rho GH. That's right. So we replace this with That's our variation of pressure with depth, right? P naught is the atmospheric pressure out here, and there's also air pressure on this side as well. I think for some reason we're gonna say that these two kind of cancel each other out, similar to what we did with our uh, the problem we did um, before. Oops, didn't mean to do that. It won't change my focus. Right, we did the problem with the ear, right? And we said in the case of the ear that uh, you end up getting you know, equal amounts of pressure on both sides. So I think what we can do is we can say that you could also write like minus P naught over here. Would you guys agree with that statement? That's the pressure and we have to multiply by W dy. Okay, did what I say make sense? The pressure in the water is definitely this, right? You guys all agree with that? That's definitely the pressure in the water but effectively on the other side of the dam over here, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a force as well. There's another force on the other side basically, right? And I'm just saying that whatever that is, it's gonna cancel out because there's the pressure on both sides. Does that seem fair? What do you guys think? Did I confuse you? That does make sense to you guys? Okay, okay, good. So, so we cancel out the two pressures and we're left with effectively something that it, we could call the gauge pressure, right? This is something I didn't talk about before, but gauge pressure, I think, you, I mean, reading some of the comments you guys made in the homework section, I think you guys kind of figured it out, is basically just the difference from atmospheric pressure. So gauge pressure would effectively be what we've written down here, just the rho GH part basically, right? You just ignore atmospheric pressure. You just say, okay, well that's everywhere, right? In a lot of situations, you can just say gauge pressure is just the rho GH part. Okay, it's, it's really just the difference from atmospheric pressure though. All right, so um, there's our equation. Now, it's not exactly perfect. Let me write one more line and then we'll kind of get to the point where we can actually integrate this. We're still just looking at the pressure on one strip and the force on one strip. So we have what we're left with here, rho, g, h, and then w, and then dy, okay? So we've got rho, which is a constant, it's water pressure, g, which is a constant, it's the gravitational acceleration near the planet. w is also a constant because it's just the width of the dam, and it doesn't look like the width of the dam is changing. Although in principle it could, right? You could make the dam walls so that they got skinnier toward the bottom or 
vice versa, they could be skinnier at the top if you're designing the dam. You could decide for yourself if that was good or bad. But in this case, the width of the dam is the same from top to bottom. So all this stuff is constant. And really what we're interested in is, do any of these variables change when y changes? Right? Do any of the variables here change when y changes? And you guys tell me, do they? Do any of the variables change when y changes? H does, right? OK, so what should we do? How do I rewrite H so that it includes the coordinate y right here? What is h equal to? We've got to have a y in there of some kind. There you go. Ramaya answered the question, or Ramya answered the question. Um, it's h minus y, right? Because maybe it makes it a little more clear if I say that this is y, basically, right? So y plus h equals big H. Or if I take capital H minus y, that gives me little h. Okay, that's just simple sort of adding things in, in one dimension. That allows us to rewrite our equation here. So now we can say df is going to be equal to uh, rho g w. Those are all of our constants multiplied by h minus y dy. That gives me, this is the force only on the red piece right here, right? on that one red piece, or really any, any red slip that we've cut out here. So um, can you guys tell me, what, what do we do next now? Our goal is to determine the resultant force exerted by the water on the dam. Or the total for resultant means the total force, right? Yeah, integrate both sides. That's right. We're going to integrate the left side. And we're going to integrate this side. We need limits too, right? What limits would I want to use here? We want to integrate over y. So y varies from what to what. If I go, for example, let's say we go from this point to this point, because we always want to kind of go in the direction of increasing y for our things. What would I put? What is y equal to at the bottom right here? 0 to h, that's right. When you integrate something like this, so like, I, I often, with these kind of problems, I don't even think about this left-hand side as being an integral so much as you're summing up a df at this point plus a df at this point plus a df at this point plus you're adding up little dfs all the way across the object. So it's really more like a sum. I mean, an integral at the end of the day is like an infinitesimal sum, right? So what we'll get on the left-hand side is just kind of like the total force, right? And on the right-hand side, we just need to do this integral right here. Can you guys do that and tell me what you get? The, here, let me move this down just a little bit. The rho g and w come out of the equation. They're just constants, density of water acceleration due to gravity, width. So all we're really integrating is this thing from 0 to h. You guys want to do the integral and tell me what you get? What's the prereq for this class again? Is it concurrent enrollment and Physics 2, or Calculus 2? Like, are you guys taking Calculus 2 now, or are you, I think it's concurrent, right? So some of you might just now be taking Calculus 2. Interesting, okay, that's fine. If you haven't covered integrals yet, that's, that's okay. I, but I think like in Calc 1, you probably do integrals at the end, don't you? Like you've seen an integral before, right? Is that right? Calculus 1, you guys do integrals toward the end, so you've at least seen it before, or no? They've seen it. Good. Cool. Okay, take your time. Solve this integral. See what you get.
That's your answer? That's your answer, is a squared over 2? Okay. Let's see if other people... Okay, it sounds like Kenny got the same answer. All right. That looks right, what John Hilliard put. Yeah. So you guys are all getting uh, h squared over 2 or 0.5 times h squared. That looks right. Okay, we'll just work that out real quick. This is really simple. Uh, what is this going to be? So this is going to give us... h is a constant, so we get h times y. Uh, minus the antiderivative of y is going to be y squared over 2. We're going from 0 to h. Plugging in h, we get h squared minus h squared divided by 2. Okay, this is exactly what you just said, uh, Cam, I think. And then minus 0 and 0. When you plug in 0, you get 0. Um, yep, so you guys are right. So you end up getting 1 half rho g w h squared. Yeah, that's the answer. You guys have any questions? Oh, look, it writes off the screen. I didn't know it did that. It's kind of a neat little problem where you can use calculus to figure out. Yeah. Does, do you want to try to gauge why is it that the dam is thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom? What do you guys think? Yeah, less pressure up top. Can we go? Yeah, Co. we can do that. We'll talk about why we had to subtract P naught. It's because atmospheric pressure acts um, on the left-hand side. It has the effect of increasing the water pressure, right? But then there's, there's forces on both sides of the dam, right? There's the force on this side, and there's the force on this side. The force on the left-hand side is going to be greater because it includes water, right? So you could say this is the force of the water, this is the force of the air, and if I want to find the net force, I would have to take the force of the water minus the force of the air. That's why we got rid of the P-naughts here, is because it's acting on both sides. You guys have any other questions about this? Oh, whoops. All right. Um, I think that's it for statics, unless there's some problems from your homework that you guys had questions about. Were there any problems from your guys' homework you have questions about? You'll have some more homework problems that are going to look a little bit like this. And I can't remember if I gave you any that were like this, but I'll probably add some of those on this next homework, too. All the homework is still from the same. We're still on Chapter 12. Okay. Cool. Um, what I would like to do now is to do roll before we go on break. Ko, if you're having a question, keep... Yeah, keep asking. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.